right here. All right. So it's a commonplace action, but some distraction kept us from, from realizing what we're doing. Okay? We just weren't thinking about there was nothing intentional about where we put, placed them. You follow what I'm saying? The older I get, the more I'm learning how important it is to do things with some intentionality to them. I, I, I got it on. With some intentionality to it. All right? For instance, when we're in church and we're singing a song or somebody else is singing a song, to intentionally listen for the message in that song. Did you hear the words she was singing? Did you catch the words? Now, I like the melody, and you're right, it's a little bit Irishy. I told, she said this, the group she normally hears sing this, they, they, they have a little Irishy sound. I said, well, is this one Irishy? Because if it is, I'm eating Lucky Charms while you're singing. I like Irishy stuff. And Lucky Charms, well, that's Irishy. It's got a leprechaun. And, uh, but that was good. But did you hear the words? One, one place in particular. In seasons of pain and uh, no, in seasons of sorrow and blessing, I give you my pain and my praise. Well, that's strong. Is that not strong? I mean, that does something for me. Because we're always, real, when things are going good, in those seasons of blessing, we're always ready to say, oh, yeah, God's good to me. But when things aren't going so good, hey, he's still a good God. Isn't he? So I want to encourage you, in everything you do, start trying to be intentional about it. Have you ever read your Bible, read a chapter of the Bible, when you got to the end, you thought, oh, I don't even know what I read. Did that ever happen to anybody? Okay, the reason is we weren't doing it with some intentionality. There have been times where I've been reading my Bible while thinking of something totally different. Getting into, and how do you do that? I have no clue, but I, 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 I can do it. Get it in the chapter and think, man, you know what? I was not even paying attention to what I was reading. Go back and read it again, and man, how the Lord can speak to you. When you pray, praying with intentionality. God, I'm intentionally talking to you. When you uh, uh, read the scripture when you hear the scripture when you're listening to a sermon when you're listening to a song when you're singing a song sing hey listen folks <clears throat> this book here we, we sing these songs uh, oh boy those songs are old as dirt well they're not quite that old okay there's some fairly old in here but that doesn't take away the message of these words and if you'll if you'll listen to this all to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. Well, that's a powerful message right there, isn't it? Say amen. I, so I want to encourage you, the church, if you want to grow spiritually and you want to have some, some fire to your spiritual life and you want to have an exciting spiritual life, then it's going to have to be intentional because, let's see, how many of you have been saved in here 10 years or more? You've been, you've been saved. Okay, how many of you been saved for 20 years or more? How many have been saved 30 years or more? How many of you have been going to church since you was a kid? Anybody in here like that? Okay, look here. Now, if you're not careful, that going to church, singing songs, reading the Bible, that becomes as commonplace as taking keys out of my pocket and laying them down. All right? But I get distracted in my thoughts and I no longer intentionally listen and I lay them somewhere else. Somebody sings a song that, man, God was wanting to use it to bless me. Somebody preaches a sermon, teaches a lesson. You read something in the Bible and God says, boy, this is exactly what they need. But because you weren't keyed in on it, it's become commonplace. You've grown apathetic and cold. You miss it. And the spiritual life becomes stale. What a tragedy. Am I right? What a tragedy, man. What a tragedy. All right, hey, turn to Job chapter 28. Job chapter 20. Before I, before I preach, uh, Ethan was going to sing a song for us today. That's what your grandmother told me. Is that right? I'm just messing with you, buddy. Uh, she's not really going to sing a song. It's Dalen, right? No. Nah. Job chapter 28. Job chapter 28. Hey, listen, there's a, an activity coming up. When's that uh, UMO? Uh, the third. February 3rd is church night at UMO. Uh, I think they have a girls' basketball game and a guys' basketball game. You talk about a lot of fun, okay? And they're going to have, like, some halftime 
uh, competitions and different competition shootout and stuff. And uh, I'd love for us, as many of you can, uh, to come with us. It costs a dollar to get in, okay? Right now, the UMO men, if they won this week, and I can't remember if they won yesterday or not, but they're undefeated in their conference. They're playing some great basketball. The girls, I think, right now are at 500 in their conference. They're playing some really good basketball, and it's a lot of fun, a great group, and uh, uh, it'll be just, uh, just come on out there, plan on that, January, February 3rd, right? All right. Hey, Job chapter 28. Now, I want you to check this out here. Job, I was reading this last week, and man, this chapter, I've read it before, and it just jumped out at me. What a beautiful way Job describes what's going on here. Let's start in verse 1. Now, we're going through this whole chapter rather quickly. We may, we may skip some things in it, but we're going to go through it. Chapter 1, surely there is a, a, a vein for the silver and a place for the gold where they find it. Okay, so silver and gold both, they run in veins, right? You know how they do it when they mine it, they find that gold, they follow that vein, and they, until that vein runs out or until it runs into a bigger vein, there's, you, you find that vein, and boy, that, it's like a pathway, all right? And that's how they find the gold. Iron is taken out of the earth. You can't see it just walking around. It's hidden in the earth, and if you want it, you've got to take it out. Brass is molten out of the stone. Now here, it's t- when it says he, he's talking about man. He setteth an end to darkness. In other words, those dark places, those caverns, those caves, uh, those pits where the gold, the silver, the brass, the iron can be found, he brings light into those hidden areas. And searcheth out all perfection, the stones of, of darkness and the shadow of death. The flood breaketh out from the inhabitant. Even the water's forgotten of by the foot. So the, the water, this talking about miners here, and the waters that would run in there. Man, man is smart enough, and he's so eager to get the gold, the silver, the, the brass, the iron, that he will divert the waters, those hidden waters that would threaten to flood the mines. He can divert those waters. Why? Because he's wanting, wanting that gold, that silver, that iron, that brass. Look, look at verse 5. As for the earth, out of it cometh bread, and under it is turned up as it were fire. The stones of it are the place of sapphires, and it hath dust of gold. So these sapphires, gold, silver, iron, brass, it's not just laying out all over the top of the ground. You realize that, right? If it were, we'd be going out picking it up, right? If if out there the ground was covered in gold, how many of you be picking it up? Yeah, we'd be picking it up. How many of you would like to have about 100 pounds of gold? Wouldn't that be nice to have a hundred pounds? You know how much money that would be? More than I got in my pocket. How many of you are willing to go digging and looking for it? We say we will, but we're not doing it, are we? So we're not willing enough. But he says that to find these things, people will dig for it. Look at verse 7. There is a path which no fowl knoweth, which the vulture's eye hath not seen. The lion's whelps have not trodden it, nor the fierce lion passed by it. Once again, for these precious things, that path, the the birds of the air don't even know where it is. The lion's whelps, they've never seen it. But man, he wants it so bad, he'll he'll get it. Listen to what he says in verse 9. He putteth forth his hand upon the rock. He overturneth the mountains by the roots. That's what man is willing to do in order to find those precious things. He cutteth out rivers among the rocks, and he seeth, and his eye seeth, Every precious thing. He bindeth the floods from overflowing, and the thing that is hid bringeth he forth to light. So he says, here's what man does. Man does some incredible things, folks. He finds, he figures out, he researches, and finds out where these precious metals are. He is willing to uproot mountains, to go down in the belly of the earth and find these precious things he will he will invest blood sweat and tears into finding these things that can bring him material wealth now look at the next verse but where shall wisdom be found 
Where is the place of understanding? He said, man it, it will find all these hidden treasures that are hidden deep in the earth. He will look, he'll pour tons of, of effort and time into it. Where's wisdom? How, how do you find that? Where do you find understanding? He says, man knoweth not the price thereof, neither is it found in the land of the living. He said, man, this is more precious, this is more rare even than gold and silver and sapphires and, and brass and iron. Verse 14, the depth saith, it is not in me. And the sea saith, it is not with, it, with me. He says, even that in the depths of the ocean. Hey, wisdom, it's not here. Down here in the depths of the ocean and the farthest recesses of, of the waters, uh, uh, it's not here. Listen to what it says about this wisdom and understanding. It cannot be gotten for gold. Neither shall silver be weighed for the price thereof. It cannot be valued with the gold of Ophir, with the precious onyx or the sapphire. The gold and the crystal cannot equal it, and the exchange of it shall not be for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of pearls, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. <clears throat> the topaz of Ethiopia <clears throat> shall not equal it, neither shall it be valued with pure gold. So he says, look, man will uproot mountains, divert streams of waters, uh, 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 dig into places where light has never been and shine light on it. He will overturn the earth, all for these things that bring monetary value, onyx, sapphire, brass, uh, uh, gold, iron, silver, all these things, diamonds, all these things. He said, but you get all that together, and with that, you can't purchase wisdom. Wisdom and understanding is of so much more value than anything we can find. Miss Mary, what in the world? That's probably Trump calling you, getting some advice. Give him some good advice, okay? <laughs> now listen, let's go a little further here. Look down in verse... Um, Let's look down in verse 28. Oh, 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 oh let's look in uh, um, verse number 22. Listen to what the destruction and death said. We have heard the fame thereof with our ears. We've heard of wisdom. We've heard of understanding. God understandeth the way thereof, and he knoweth the place thereof. Look in verse number 28. And unto man he said, Behold the fear of the Lord. That is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. I want to talk to you a little bit tonight about three things in the Bible. Knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. And I'm trying to lay a groundwork here because in, uh, I'll see next Sunday night, Brother Gallahue is going to uh, uh, bring us something from the book of Proverbs about the subject of depression. Uh, two weeks from tonight, uh, the one and only, the man, the myth, and the legend, Jeremiah Wright, is going to be bringing us a lesson from Proverbs on stewardship, what the Bible says about being a good steward, not just of money, but of time, of life, and all that. And then we have some other, Sasha back there. He's going to be teaching on something. We're still working on that. Uh, Brother Danny Lamprin, the, the uh, teaching on, on pride. Uh, <laughs> I love picking with him. Uh, we're going to have some people teaching. Listen to Proverbs 1.7. Look at Proverbs 1.7. Proverbs 1.7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of what? Knowledge. The fear of the Lord. Now, a lot of people quote that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay? But, and, and the Bible does say that. Here it says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. So wisdom, instruction, knowledge, understanding, discernment, prudence, they are all connected, though a little different from each other, they are all connected. Listen to Proverbs 15.33. The fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. Now, let's stop for a minute. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. 
there are some scientists out there that have no fear of the Lord, and they say that science has led them away from a belief in God, and because of science, they can no longer believe in God. There's no fear of the Lord there. Therefore, many of their presuppositions are grounded in pure speculation, and there's really, though they say they're scientists, there's no scientific proof to back up many of their claims. There are scientists who started with the fear of God, the presupposition that God is the creator of all things and that it is the honor of kings to search out a matter and so their fear of God drove them to science which revealed to them more of the glory of God and a certainty that the word of God is true and that the creator God is indeed real and true and they're dedicated Christians. Look in Proverbs 19, or Proverbs 9.10. I'll just read it for you. Here it says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, what does that mean, the fear of the Lord? I've heard some say, well, that means you're to be scared of it. I've heard some say, oh, no, it's a, a, an awe and respect. I contend that it's both. Listen to what, uh, I, forgot, I didn't write down who said it, but they said it very well. Listen to this. The proper fear of the Lord is coupled with love and trust. It is almost a childlike combination of holy respect and glowing love. The fear of the Lord is the convergence of awe, reverence, adoration, honor, worship, confidence, thankfulness, love, and yes, fear. We are foolish to not have some fear of God. Hey, listen, I love my daddy. I love my daddy with all my heart. And I know my daddy loves me. But I was smart to have a little bit of fear of daddy. You understand what I'm saying? I wasn't scared he was going to stop loving me. I was scared because he did love me. And he cared too much to let me run around on the town and go out carousing, staying out all, all uh, times of night and doing things I shouldn't do. I knew daddy loved me enough, he'd jerk a knot at me. So there was a fear, but a respect, an awe, an admiration. Yes, fear in the presence of the eternal God, the creator of the universe, the holy lawgiver, the righteous judge, and the merciful Savior. So for those who are in, the, in Christ, the fear of the Lord does not involve this terror or, or dread of divine justice, but it is the beginning of a path that leads to wisdom. And this path begins with with the knowledge of God, knowing about our God. Now, I'll check this out. We will work hours upon hours upon hours for what? Work for it. Money. Is that right? And we got to have money to live. It takes money to live. Um, uh, you got to put beans on the table, roof over your head, clothes on our back. We will work like a dog so that we can have money to buy things, some things we need, some we don't need, that are just going to, uh, moths are going to eat it, uh, a rust is going to corrupt it, it's going to fall apart, we're going to get rid of it one, day, one day. We will work and work and work to get those things. But we will not put in that kind of effort find wisdom. Job said, uproot now what a right there of our determination and go has to find the depth
go through things that men will risk life and limb for. You cannot buy things. Wisdom is so much more rare. Wisdom is so much more important. And you can't buy wisdom with those things. Here's where you find wisdom. The head is the We have in the Bible a direct to get wisdom and to get a gift. If you want it, hey, it's available. Get, get, um, uh, um, uh, not fine. And the well of the Lord. You read the book of Ecclesiastes, and he, he set his heart to enjoy everything on this earth that there was to enjoy. And at the end of it all, he said it was all what? Vanity. You know what vanity is? It's emptiness. If right now you reach up and say, Oh, I, I feel the heat blowing, I'm going to catch some of it. Look in your hand, it's not there. You go outside and say, oh, there's the wind. I'm going to catch some and take it home. And, and you catch it and say, hey, do this. Ethan. you go home and say, hey, Mom, look, here, I, I brought something for you. I brought you some wind. You say, dang, I can't let you go with this. It's empty. It's a waste. And this Solomon, who had experienced all the earth, well, Get understanding. Verse 7. Just two verses. Wisdom. Um, principal thing. First thing. The foundational thing. Therefore, get wisdom. All thy getting, get understanding. Charles Spurgeon said, use of knowledge. Is not your full is no full so full, but to know how to use knowledge is to have wisdom. Look, this just knowing makes somebody wise, that makes them knowledgeable. Charles Spurgeon was saying, Wisdom is knowing how to use that knowledge, how to use it aright. Now look, there's, we see this, how the value of wisdom. We see that though man will work so hard for material things that are going to corrupt, and by the way, you can't ever take it with you. I think there used to be an old song about uh, uh, pulling a, uh, a U-Haul behind a hearse or something. Uh, it, it does you no good. You can't take it with you, not a single bit of it. You'll work so hard for those things, and, and Job said, but, what about wisdom? You're not working for wisdom. You don't do the. You don't uproot mountains trying to find wisdom. There's several methods of getting wisdom. Look in Psalm 119, 104. Psalm 119, 104. Psalm 119, 104. I'll go ahead and read it. You can write it down. Look at it later if you're not there yet. Through thy precepts, I get understanding. Therefore, I hate every thought. I precept find them right in the Bible. It says if you want wisdom, if you want understanding, those things value the gold, gold more, more valuable than the silver, the diamonds, all those things. Then listen, here's what you need to do. Get it from God's Word. Imagine if we put the effort into getting into God's Word and digging out the wisdom to live this life uh, uh, rightly that men put into getting material gain. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the difference it would make in our marriages, in our homes, at our workplace? Hey, what? Um, imagine what a difference it would make if, if God's people got so serious 
about God's wisdom and God's understanding. Instead of putting so many hours into trying to get material things, we began to dig into the Word of God and get His wisdom and understanding out of here. Imagine how much power the church would have then. So we get wisdom and understanding from his word. Proverbs 15, 32. He that refuseth instruction despiseth his own soul, but he that heareth reproof getteth understanding. We get understanding, we get wisdom. James. If any want. All men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to him. So look, we get wisdom. We get wisdom from, from God's word. Learning and understanding from, from asking God. And Proverbs twenty two seventeen. this goes with the second one. Bow down thy eyes. We get wisdom from bound wise people. Now, knowledge, understanding, and wisdom. I want to try to help you understand or under, or I want to try to help you visualize the difference because there is a, a difference, though they are connected. Knowledge deals with the facts. How much is two plus two? Four. That's knowledge. Okay? That's a fact. We know the fact of two plus two is four. <clears throat> Understanding deals with meaning. So knowledge deals with the facts, understanding deals with the meaning, and wisdom is, deals with what to do next. So 2 plus 2 is what? Okay, so that's a fact, right? But what does that mean? Okay, let's see. Brother Jesse, can you stand up? Brother Freddie, can you stand up? How many people are standing there? Two. Mary, can you stand Stand up. Ethan, can you stand up? How many people are standing here? No, no, I mean on this side. Okay, two. So I have two, and I have how many over here? Two. So that means how many are standing in total? That's your son. Now that's your son. To do what? Oh, because I'm standing. Stupid kid. <laughs> Other than me, how many people are standing? Four. Okay. So the meaning is I take two, one, two, and I add two to it, one, two, and that gives me a total of four. Okay, you can be seated. Now, wisdom deals with what comes next. Knowledge is the fact. Understanding is the principle. Wisdom is the practice. So if I understand that 1, 2 plus 1, 2 equals 1, 2, 3, 4, now I can take that principle. I know the fact. I have an understanding of it now. I know what it means. Now I can take that principle, and guess what? I can add as high as 3 plus 3 now. I can add 4 plus 4. I can add 5 plus 5 because I've got the understanding of it, and I know how to use the knowledge and the principle to do what comes next. Do you, do you, are you following me, church? Okay. Man, I don't know. I might be using too big a numbers there. I should start with 1 plus 1. All right. Knowledge has to do with the information. Understanding with the meaning and not wisdom with what to do next. No, oh, I'm sorry. Knowledge has to do with the information. Understanding with the principles. Wisdom with the application. I can look in college. I can. Just the facts alone, I, I need some understanding. So if this is what... God is like, this is what God likes and dislikes, this is done what He intends to do, God's desires, 
what does that mean? How does that translate when I see what God did here? How does that translate in my life today? And how am I going to use that in my life tomorrow? How am I going to take this knowledge and understanding, uh, this fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. It sets me on the right path. That's all it does, though. It, it sets me on the right path. That's just the beginning. But now I want to use those principles to travel this path so that tomorrow, so that a week, so that a year from now, so that five years from now, so for ten years from now, guess what? I'm still walking in God's will and in God's blessings. That's what wisdom does for us. Corresponds with your memory. Understanding corresponds with your action. Wisdom, I'm, I'm sorry, understanding corresponds with your reason and wisdom corresponds with action. It's putting that knowledge and the principles gained from that knowledge, it is now him into use. We know some things that the Bible says about finances, but how do we end up in a financial mess? Not most because we did pulls of God's word and stewardship. We didn't put them into practice. We didn't live them. Do you understand what I'm saying, church? Scholars have knowledge. Someone who just knows a lot, I mean, they know things well, that's a scholar. Teachers have understanding. They can take the knowledge, they can teach it to somebody in a way that they then can grasp that knowledge and maybe gain an understanding as well. Practitioners have wisdom. It's the ones that take that knowledge, not just for knowledge's sake, but to learn the principles to help them develop sound scriptural reasoning so that they then can take what they've learned and say, now, hey, look, now I see how I'm supposed to live life. I see how I'm supposed to live life as a husband, as a wife, as a child, as a parent, as an employee, as an employer, as a neighbor. Listen to this verse here and I'll, I'll be done. Proverbs 3.13, here's the result of finding wisdom and understanding. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. How many of you want to be happy? Anybody wake up this morning and say, boy, I, I hope today is a miserable day. No, we want to be happy. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom. Does that mean, or, and let me go on and read that, and the man that getteth understanding. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom, and the man that getteth understanding. Preacher, I want to be happy. Let me tell you something. Happiness does not come from immediate gratification. That's not where happiness comes from. It'll bring a temporary happiness, a spark of happiness, but in the long run, that brings misery and destruction. Happiness comes from having God's wisdom and God's understanding. Listen, you live for God or don't live for God. Whatever path you're traveling, there's going to be mountaintops and valleys. That's on both ways. Or the narrow way, there's mountains and valleys. There are good times and there are tough times. All right? But if I'm walking in God's wisdom and in his understanding and his knowledge and un uh, discernment and prudence, that end result that I'm looking for. That's where the joy and the satisfaction is. That's where the purpose is. And let me tell you, only on that path guided by his wisdom and his understanding. Are you following me, church? It's not just, well, I know what the Bible says. 
A lot of people know what the Bible says, but don't live by it. I've heard this for many, many years. Well, I know what the Bible says, Brother Ronnie, but I'm going to do it this way. I know what the Bible says, and I know I ought to be doing it this way, but I'm just not ready. Do you know what that is? That is someone resisting God's wisdom and understanding. I want to tell you what that does. It brings destruction. In the coming Sunday nights, a good men around me. Or I, I want to give some of these men give them an opportunity. Don't just believe them because they said it, by the way. Measure their words by the Word of God. And we're going to dig into this book of Proverbs, this book of wisdom and understanding. And hopefully when we come out on the other side, hey, listen, young people, let me tell you something. Young people, there's all these things out there in this world distracting you, all these philosophies trying to pull you one way that will lead you to nothing but heartache. Let's get in here. Let's dig for wisdom. Let's something like they do silver to divide, willing to, to up, willing to dig into the areas of the earth that have never seen light and bring light to it. Willing to risk life and limb. Let's get serious enough about digging into the Word of God that we'll do that. How about it? You think we can do that, church? Hey, let's but real quick then good piece of wisdom right here, a good piece of uh, understanding and wisdom in this verse, Psalm 1-1. We're working on it this night. Say it with me. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sin, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Boy, that's good. I hope y'all memorize that this week. Let's pray, or let's uh, bow our head, close our eyes, and uh, let's stand, please. Let's